Hi, everybody. Welcome to our second cafe of this, uh, this academic year. Um, my name is Doug Gann. I'm a preservation archaeologist with, I, I want to say, the Center for Desert Archaeology, but with Archaeology Southwest. Um, thank you for joining us all tonight. I apologize that we're crammed in here like sardines in a tin can, but uh, just it's great to see such interest in a, in a really fascinating topic. Um, for those of you who have not been here before, uh, our speaker usually speaks for about half an hour, and the really fun thing about archaeology cafes is, is the question and answer session, and that's what we're really all here for. We always get great questions. There's always a lot of really good food for thought, so we are happy to open the floor to questions. We are recording this for all of the poor people that we had to turn away at the door. I think we've never turned away so many people before. Um, and so usually it's for people on the internet, but tonight we're going to be especially uh, vigilant to make sure that when you ask your question, if you could raise your hand so I can get your, your, your question on the soundtrack so that all those people that got turned away will actually hear your question and know what our, our speaker is actually talking about. Um, I'm very pleased to introduce Homer Thiel. Um, if you want to talk about... Uh, People departed from the, the Tucson Basin in the historic period. I don't think there's anyone who has more expertise in this subject. So I'm going to turn the talk over to Homer, and away we'll go. Yes, I see dead people. <laughs> so um, uh, I guess I, to sort of give you a background on why I'm interested in this topic, um, I became uh, a genealogist back in 1977 when I was a very young teenager. And my grandma would take me to the family cemeteries, and I would look at the tombstones, and then I would research the people and find out their histories. So I've always been interested in basically dead people. And uh, one of the very first projects that I uh, worked on, well, I didn't work on it, but Desert Archaeology back in 1991 worked on a portion of the Presidio Cemetery. And that got me interested in the old cemeteries of Tucson. So I started researching all of the abandoned historic cemeteries that have since been, been built over. I, uh, every table should have one of the handouts that I handed out. And on that, the first map is a map showing the locations of the five major abandoned historic cemeteries in Tucson. And I'll start with the oldest one, which is at the Mission of San Augustine. That was the uh, site that Father Kino came to in the late 1690s, a small Pima village called Chukchon, and the Spaniards mangled that and made it into Tucson. And he established a visiting mission there. And uh, beginning in 1700, uh, a priest would come up occasionally from the Mission of San Javier and would perform baptisms, marriages, and if he happened to be there when someone died, he would perform burials. And in 1757, they completed a church at the site. And uh, furthermore, in the 1790s, they, they came up after San Javier was finished and completed that mission site. And there were two cemeteries at that site. The one immediately adjacent to the church was the cemetery for the European people. And then along the north wall of the mission complex, there was a church for the Native American residents of the community. So uh, that particular mission, uh, beginning in the 1820s, the, it was basically emptied out as people died and, and moved elsewhere. And the site gradually decayed. Uh, the Convento building was the last major standing structure. And beginning in the 1940s, the Tucson Pressed Brick Company started digging uh, holes in the ground near the mission site to get materials to make bricks for the university and other structures. And one day, the uh, huge, giant uh, backhoe operator uh, was cutting a cut uh, along one area, and he saw a skeleton in the ground. So he was smart enough to call the university, and they came down and discovered that there was a uh, early agricultural period uh, cemetery there. And then the university got interested in the mission period cemeteries, and the physical anthropologist at the time went out there and excavated uh, burials from both of the cemeteries. And um, he wasn't trained as an archaeologist. And there, are, if you go to the archives at the University of Arizona, you can see snide letters written by the anthropologist about him because he did a really bad job. But uh, he, there was a, several years of projects out there. They rescued a, maybe 100 skeletons. And then the uh, large portions of the site were destroyed by the uh, first by the brick company and then by the the city of Tucson, who turned it into a garbage dump. And then when we went out there in the um, 
uh, around 2000, 2001 to do work for the Rio Nuevo project, we actually discovered that a portion of the Native American cemetery was intact and in place. And we left that uh, alone. We, we covered up those graves with a protective fabric uh, because the plan was when they rebuilt the mission to rebuild the wall around the cemetery and reconsecrate it and then rebury the remains uh, that were over at the university uh, in the cemetery. So on the handout I have uh, from that particular site, I have the map of the Native American cemetery area. And um, the people that, that were buried there were buried, uh, laid out, extended in the typical Christian fashion. Some of the people buried there had uh, religious medals and crucifixes around their necks. And uh, Recently, a guy named Bob Dayhoff at the University of Arizona has examined the skeletons that they still have, and he made some interesting finds. He's, he discovered that the women all had extensive arthritis in their shoulders, and we, he thinks, and it's very likely, that it was from grinding corn. The rhythmic movement back and forth on the matate holding the mano eventually created uh, arthritis even among women uh, in their 30s and 40s. He found that there was a lot of evidence for violence. Four of the people buried there out of the about 50 adults had evidence for head trauma. They had been hit on the head, and one person had an arrow lodged in their chest. And these residents of the mission were having problems up until the 1790s with the Apaches coming and raiding Tucson, and uh, that's evidence for uh, the uh, violence that took place. As well, there was evidence, uh, they had pretty good teeth, a lot of cavities though. Uh, as you got older, you started losing your molars and gradually you lost your teeth towards the front of your mouth so that by the time you were say 50, you probably maybe had one or two teeth left. Um, which is a little, you know, happens today too, I guess. So uh, that's the first abandoned cemetery. The second abandoned cemetery is just a few blocks that way over in the Barrio Libre. And this was a big surprise. Back in 1995, Southwest Gas was replacing gas lines in the, those neighborhoods. And um, one of my coworkers was scraping the wall of a trench to see what was there. And the dirt fell away, and there was a skull sticking out. And so we went out, and we excavated that burial, and then discovered that there was another one immediately adjacent to it. And then uh, the following year, the landowner across the street was digging a sewer line and hit another burial. And the backhoe operator called my friend, Dan Arnett, who's a backhoe operator. And Dan called me. And by the time I got there, the, the homeowner had thrown all the bones out onto the sidewalk, oh uh, because, which is actually was quite illegal. I, mean, I should have called the police on him, uh, because he didn't want to, the bother of, you know, he was paying for that backhoe time and didn't want to have to pay for extra time. But anyways, so at that time there were three skeletons uncovered and then a few years ago another two were found when the adjacent homeowner built uh, a house. What was interesting about these burials is uh, the bone is in very fresh condition. Like when you looked at it, it looked like the person had been buried there just yesterday. Uh, but each of the burials was buried in a flexed position, the sort of fetal position. And three of the five had red ochre pigment uh, staining their bones. Um, that's very typical of, of historic and prehistoric Native American burials to have red ochre pigment uh, because they would sometimes have it on their clothing or in the historic period, uh, at least the Pima up near Phoenix uses a sunscreen. And, but we didn't find any artifacts, so we were a little bit, uh, uh, we, we really didn't know what was going on with that cemetery. Well, just a, probably last month, I was looking through uh, old newspapers and came across a quote that sort of solves the problem as to who was buried there. Um, in 1883, he says, if the authorities could compel the Papago Indians to bury their dead instead of throwing their remains in a shallow ditch in the southern part of the city and covering them with loose stones, they would greatly improve the sanitary condition of the town. It is to hope the matter will be investigated and attended to at once. And there was a, a Tohono O'odham or Papago community just uh, within five blocks of that area. And apparently these were uh, non missionized Tona Odom that had moved into the community and were dying and were being buried in a traditional manner at this particular uh, location. Uh, and one aspect of the, this sort of thing is, is 
keeping, uh, I have to keep reminding the city that there is a cemetery there because there's no you know, external evidence for it. And you know, utility crews come in to replace a sewer and they dig a, a trench down the middle of the street and they hit bodies. So um, that's one aspect of, of my job is to keep on telling people like, you can't dig there. The third cemetery is the Presidio Cemetery. And that is located mostly beneath Alameda Street, west of Church. And it is the cemetery for the uh, Presidio soldiers and the civilians. And it dates from 1776, which was the year the uh, first people moved up here from Tubac. And it was in use until the sometimes perhaps the mid-1850s. Now, we know that there was a... At, one time a book of records that listed all the burials because we have an inventory for the church that says that the, the burial records start in 1781. But in 1856, when the Mexican soldiers uh, evacuated Tucson, they loaded up all the records of the community, all the church records, and the military records, and the civilian records, put them on a cart to take to the Mexican town of Imuras. And two of the soldiers would later describe how the uh, the disgruntled soldiers tore up the record books and used them as cigarette papers. So uh, we do not have a list of the people buried in the Presidio Cemetery other than a, a f maybe 10 individuals that I know about. Um, and the community of Tucson at that time had perhaps 500 people living in it during that 90 year period. And if you think uh, uh, five to 10% were dying every year, there was probably 1, 1,000, 1,500 people in that little plot. If you look at the, the map, that is from our 1991 uh, Southwest Gas Trench, and you can see how clustered the burials are. They're, when they would dig in a new burial, they would cut through three or four other burials, they would lay the body out, and then they would lay the remains that they collected from the previous burials on, their, uh, on the foot of the coffin or the foot of the grave or pile them on top of the people's knees. There appear to be small little family plots and uh, because you have little clusters of burials and then there'll be vacant spaces in between. And uh, these people were, were buried in shrouds. They, they did not have coffins, with one exception. They would, when a person died, the, uh, they would take their clothes off because the clothes were so valuable uh, that they wouldn't dream of actually burying a person in clothing. And then they would wrap them in a sheet, and then they would dig a hole in the ground and pop them in. And then uh, five years later, they would dig through them to put uh, somebody else in. Uh, we know that uh, there was a church that, uh, there. The cemetery was located around the north and south sides of the church in the vicinity of the Pima County Courthouse. And there were burials that took place underneath the floor of the church. And when the... Uh, Presidio chaplain, Father Pedro Uriquibar, died in 1820. In his will, it said, I desire that my body be buried in the church at the altar steps on the gospel side with a solemn mass requiem, and that my body be carried in procession with the honor due to me as a chaplain about the plaza of my company in order to arouse my faithful people to pray to God for the welfare of my soul. Um, we know that the... the uh, Cemetery was decorated with a metal cross, and it had a gate that could lock so they could keep the dogs and other animals out. When uh, Bob Dayhoff also looked at these skeletons uh, as part of his study, and he said that um, there was a lot of evidence for infection in these people, childhood malnutrition. Uh, they had more malnutrition among these children than those noted for uh, contemporary Native American populations. And the women also had evidence for uh, arthritis in their shoulders from uh, grinding uh, corn and wheat on the manos and matates. And again, the, uh, that cemetery, there's, there's probably hundreds of bodies there underneath Alameda Street, the adjoining sidewalks, the uh, area between the sidewalk and the courthouse, and even below the courthouse, because in 1942, the sheriff's office floor collapsed. And when they pulled up the loose flooring, they discovered that there were bodies underneath the floor of the uh, sheriff's office. <laughs> so by the 1850s, and starting in 1856, Americans started coming. Uh, the, the very first American, I think, uh, well, one of them was uh, Solomon Warner in 1855. But the next year, uh, two things happened. There was a, a big increase in population, or three things. 
Secondly, there were non-Catholics moving to the community, so they could not be buried into the Presidio Chapel Cemetery. And uh, the third thing was the cemetery was just full. So they began a new cemetery. And I don't know how many of you were here when the talk about the National Cemetery, the Alameda Stone Cemetery a few years ago. Uh, that was the cemetery where the Joint Courts building is being constructed. And statistical research excavated the majority of that cemetery uh, back in 2006 to 2008 and found over 1,000 burials. Um, the cemetery started out in, we know uh, there was two areas. There was a military area that was in use from 1862 to 1881, and that's where the soldiers from uh, Camp Lowell and then Fort Lowell were buried, as well as uh, other soldiers that died in the area, including two of the people that were killed at the uh, Battle of the Picacho Peak in 1862. And then uh, surrounding it was the civilian uh, cemetery. There was an area where uh, Protestant men were likely buried immediately adjacent to the military cemetery, and then north of that was where the Catholics were buried. And uh, they found that something like 90% of the bodies had not been moved when the cemetery closed, even though the city had asked people to move their uh, relatives. They just didn't, um, in many cases, because they didn't know where they were in the cemetery, or there was no living relatives, or they just you know, didn't care. So um, now I can tell you the interesting story. The Tucson, uh, uh, well, let's, let's start at the very beginning. In um, 1872, a couple named Vicente Hernandez and Librada Chavez moved from Albuquerque to Tucson and became pawnbrokers. And they had a house over on Meyer Street and uh, became quite wealthy because that was a common thing to do as to trade your whatever it was that was valuable in to them and they would give you money. And everyone knew that they were uh, quite wealthy. So one day in August, of 1873, one of their neighbors noticed they hadn't gotten up that morning, and they went in the house and discovered that the two had been murdered. And uh, the newspaper article, let me see if I can read it to you. This is from the Arizona Daily Star. It seems both had their skulls broken with a club, and to make sure of death, the jugular veins were severed with a knife. The floor was covered with blood, and barefoot tracks were made in it. This would have been a dirt floor. The bodies were kept till yesterday morning at 8 o'clock when the funeral came off under the auspices of the Catholic Church, Father Jovencio uh, officiating. I'm not sure if I pronounce his name right, but I'm not French. The funeral was the largest we ever witnessed in Tucson and showed in what high esteem the parties were held. The family was always spoken of with great respect, which I kind of wonder why the pawnbrokers were spoken of with great respect, but... And the horror which prevailed over the murder was intensified because Mrs. Hernandez was some months advanced in pregnancy. Well, the next day, um, uh, at that time, Tucson probably had about maybe slightly less than 2,000 people. And people started telling stories to each other. And they figured out that there were these three guys that were sort of suspicious. Uh, their names were Leocardo Cordova, Clemente Lopez, and Jesus Sojoripa. And uh, they went to talk to them, and Mr. Cordova was captured first, and he immediately confessed, yes, we killed them. Um, and told the, the policeman, yes, I, we clubbed them on the head and cut their necks. When they caught the other two, one of them had blood still on his foot. Um, and then they, they, I guess, basically tortured them because they compelled them to give the evidence and tell them where the, the goods that they had stolen from the house were at. And they went out in the desert and dug a hole and found the uh, jewelry and money and some guns. And they found uh, Mr. Hernandez's uh, pocket watch still ticking. And the people of Tucson were just sick of this. Um, previously, there'd been a woman named, named Dolores Moore. She had been a, a Mexican woman that had killed her abusive husband. And she had been sentenced to die and they built the gallows, but nobody could get around to executing her because they didn't want to. So they ended up not executing her, and people were still mad about that several years later. So the next morning, early next morning, two posts forked at the top were planted in the ground near the jail door, and upon them was placed a stiff pole about 12 feet in length. 
to this pole, four ropes were fastened with nooses to each, and two wagons were drawn beneath. A Catholic priest desiring to give such consolation as he could to the doomed men, he was given all the time he desired. When through with his ministrations, it was after 11 o'clock in the morning. Very soon thereafter, the four men above named, uh, they, they, there was another murderer in the jail, so they grabbed him as well, <laughs> were brought out of jail with small black bandages over their eyes, put in the wagons, ropes adjusted to their necks, and the wagons drawn out, and all four hung side by side. Um, this is the only case of frontier justice uh, that happened in Tucson, although it was quite common in other parts of the state. Um, and after someone dies in a sort of a mysterious or unusual or uh, violent fashion, they have a coroner's jury where they pick some voters in the community and get them together and they go and view the bodies and hear testimony and then get, make a verdict as to how the person's died. And so they went and grabbed about six men, including people that probably stood there and watched it. And they all agreed that, um, yes, those men had in fact been hung and that justice had been meted out. Well, so when they uh, excavated the cemetery, I knew that they were gonna, probably gonna find this couple and probably would find the three uh, men that had been executed. And sure enough, uh, they found a pair of burials in the same burial pit. And the coffins, the, the base of one coffin had been sitting on directly on the top of another one. And when they examined the, the remains, the man was on top and he had broken uh, uh, cheekbones and he, his uh, side of his face had been smashed in, so the teeth were broken. And this guy was a fairly well-off guy. He was the only man in the entire cemetery that had a dental bridge, like a little uh, partial plate in his mouth um, with a gold tooth. And, uh, and then the side of his jaw was broken, and there was a cut mark on his jaw as well. And then the woman, she, she uh, they couldn't really tell, but her skull was poorly preserved, but... She had broken ribs that had been broken at the time she died, and there was a cut mark on one of her ribs. And you have a little bone in your throat called the hyoid that anchors your, uh, you can't really feel it, but it's in there. And this woman's hyoid had been broken, and that's very common when someone is strangled. It breaks the hyoid bone. So uh, although in this actual report, which you can read online at the Pima County Archaeology Office, they do not identify these people as this couple. It's, it's about 100% certain that they are. And there is another uh, grave in the Protestant section of the cemetery that has three men that were buried all at the same time. And it's possible that these are the three uh, Mexican men that were hung, but uh, who knows if that's actually the case. So in the handout, I have the uh, uh, photograph of some of the remains. And since these were uh, not Native Americans in the report, you, they were allowed to have pictures of the human remains, as well as the uh, drawings of the two uh, individuals in their coffins. The fifth and last, well, it's not the last ab abandoned cemeteries, because I'm not telling you about all of them, because there's some other ones too, was the cemetery that was in place after the, the cemetery at Stone and Alameda. And it opened in June of uh, 1875, and the last burial was in July of 1909. They moved it to the far north side of town, which is basically the southwest corner of Stone and Speedway, because they just knew that Tucson would never expand that far to the north. <laughs> and that particular cemetery was divided in, into halves. On the east half was the Catholic cemetery, and on the west half was the Protestant area, the uh, Jewish area, the B'nai B'rith. There was and then there were groups for fraternal organizations, the Odd Fellows, the Masons, the Grand Army of the Republic, which was the Union Veterans Group. There was the Workers of the World, the Tucson Volunteer Firemen, the Knights of Pythias, and then the uh, Pima Lodge Number 10 of the Improved Order of Redmen, which was a group of guys that would get together and dress up in Indian outfits and have parties called smokers and march in parades. And the, the very ironic thing about this group was that uh, if you were a Native American, you could not join. <laughs> um, the Salvation Army owns that particular portion of the cemetery. And so last year, uh, they hired us to look and see if there were the actual bodies were there in the ground. And so we took our backhoe and we dug stripping trenches and we located two areas with 10 burials in each area for a total of 20. And by doing, uh, my company, uh, 
my boss, Bill, who is the guy for head of Archaeology Southwest, uh, agreed to um, uh, have us put together a database on uh, everyone who died who's buried in the cemetery. And we came up with approximately 9,500 entries, which represents about 6,000 some people. And in the process of doing that, um, Chris was here. She, she and I identified 16 of the 20 people buried in those plots. And uh, they're still there in the ground because the Salvation Army doesn't have the money to exhume them. But when that takes place, we'll probably be able to identify most of those people by name. Because um, as because they died in the early 1900s, we have newspaper articles for most of them. And uh, for whatever reason, they tended to die in very bizarre and tragic ways, including uh, uh, somebody that got scared by the streetcar and their carriage overturned and his head was crushed. And there was a guy that was murdered down near Naco and um, a couple babies, a couple women. Well, um, the city of Tucson asked, uh, 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 the, ne the next page over has a, a bur unusual burial. The city of Tucson asked Desert Archaeology to look at the corner of Stone and uh, Speedway. There used to be a bank there that was torn down about five or six years ago, and it's a big v vacant lot. And the city would like to sell off that property, so they had us come in and we stripped the entire area. And we found uh, two burials, which is kind of surprising because we thought there'd be a lot more. And the second burial that we excavated was interesting because the person had been partially dug up when they were closed the cemetery. Somebody had come in to exhume the body. But it's typical when they, at this time period, they would open up the burial, find the coffin, pull open the lid, and then they would just grab parts. Uh, the, the big stuff got grabbed, usually. And so this particular person, they left behind the entire uh, right arm, most of the, or left arm, most of the left leg, some of the vertebrae. Um, and then well, we know that in this particular case, we, we, the advertisements in the newspapers, the funeral homes were busy doing this. We know that it actually was a funeral home that dug this person up because they threw 11 embalming fluid bottles down into the grave. And so all of those bottles that we see are from the um, Embalmer's Supply Company of Bridgeport, uh, Connecticut. And as uh, well, we found uh, the coffin hardware all in place. The next page is a, another set of burials we found. I, I only included one of the two burials. Uh, back in 2007, an acquaintance of mine had a sinkhole open up in his front yard in the cemetery, and he thought it was a sewer leak, so he stuck his shovel in the ground and he hit a coffin. And so Desert Archaeology, Susan and I, and some other people went and excavated the remains. And we found that there was a, a two burials stacked on top of each other. The top burial was a small child, probably a girl, based on the type of buttons that were present. And uh, what was interesting about this burial was that there was large amounts of clothing stuck in the foot of the coffin. And then uh, we finished that person, on a, it was a Friday afternoon, and I thought, it's the, the dirt is strange underneath the burial, it's not quite right. So I took my trowel and scraped, and there was another person right underneath, which was kind of unusual. And when we excavated that person, it turned out to be a man that had been buried with all of his possessions in his pockets. He had a comb and three coins, a jackknife, and a coin purse. And typically when someone dies, they go through your pockets and clean everything out. But for whatever reason, uh, the combination of this child with all of her clothing stuffed into the coffin and a man with his uh, uh, possessions in his pockets suggests that these two people probably died from some infectious disease like uh, uh, smallpox or something, where they didn't want to really go through the body and they wanted to get rid of the clothing to prevent it from spreading. And actually, in that particular case, uh, we removed the two bodies and then I took the pin flag and stuck it into the s uh, south wall of the grave and shoved right it all the way in. There's a big tree there so we couldn't dig, but there was probably two more people buried immediately adjacent. And at various times there have been smallpox epidemics uh, in 1851, a quarter of the Tucson's population died, 125 people. And then in 1870, there was another one where over 100 small children died. So it was, uh, and they, it, they eventually set up a pest, pest house where they uh, put people that had uh, smallpox and basically quarantined them. Uh, and that's, a, there was a little cemetery associated with that, but uh, that location of that one has not been known. And on the, the back page, you have um, uh, some 
photographs of the things that we found with the child's burial, the coffin hardware, uh, the little um, thing called a thumb screw that was what you screwed the lid of the coffin down on, the decorative uh, brass studs that were used to hold the fabric lining the coffin in place. And then it's not, you can't really see it, but that uh, crucifix on the back side um, had a, a, a little child praying on one side and a lamb looking up at the, at the crucifix on the other. And then the variety of buttons that we found. Uh, there's two other people in that cemetery whose locations I don't currently know, but um, I, as one of my projects now has been to identify more people buried in the cemetery. So I'm going through the Pima County inquest cases. And that's a very interesting thing because there's lots of bizarre stories of people dying on unusual circumstances. The guy that was found with a chicken eating him, that was a strange one. <laughs> there was a woman named Lola O'Sullivan who was, dis her, her, she was missing. Her, her neighbors hadn't noticed her for a long time and somebody went up to her house and something didn't smell right. So they went to the constable. The constable and his friend went out there and the, the house was locked but there was a glass window next to the door so he reached and unhooked it went inside the house and the breakfast table was set with food but there was stuff uh, like lying a basin, wash basin on the floor and there was a really bad smell. So they went back in the bedroom and they found the body of a woman underneath a quilt and she was holding the quilt up over her head with her hands clutching the edge. And when they pulled it back, uh, well, and her, here's the, sort of the backstory. Lola's husband was a scoundrel and he was a carpenter and there were, his carpenter's tools were sitting next to the quilt and his broad axe was there covered in blood. So they pulled it back. Now here's the thing, this is in 1905. The early form of CSI didn't exist. And so first of all, I had to figure out was this actually Lola? And the, the constable had had dealings with this couple before because of the domestic abuse cases and he recognized that it was her because she had one of her front teeth had been broken in half at some time, and, and the body had a broken tooth, and well, also the situation that was in the house, it seemed likely that it was Lola, and no one had seen her since she disappeared. Well, then the question is, what happened to her husband, Humphrey? He had, uh, he had been a sort of upstanding citizen, he was a contractor, he built the first dining hall for the University of Arizona, but a after Lola's, died, he disappeared. And they thought it was likely that he might have gone out into the desert and killed himself, but when they went out and looked, they couldn't find him. And then in February of 1906, uh, a group of professors from the university went out on a picnic to the Tucson Mountains, and as they were walking back, they happened to look up a ravine uh, in the Tucson Mountains, and there was a skull. And the guys went up close, and it was a skeleton of a, of a person with a bullet hole uh, in the forehead. And um, the wife of the professor used her foot to scrape away some of the uh, clothing and there was a gun. So the, and the, the, the funny thing, this is, this is in the afternoon, the professor didn't get around to telling the police about this until four o'clock the next afternoon. Which, but they went out there and they collected the remains and they thought it was likely that it was Humphrey O'Sullivan, who, who, the man who had killed his wife. But the big question was how are they gonna be able to tell because uh, the, the, the body was skeletonized except for a few portions and so they had another uh, one of these coroner's inquests. And it was interesting to read because, because their way of identifying the body was just, uh, well, he'd broken an arm, so they sliced open what little flesh was on his arm and found that he, there was a healed break, so that was a good sign. They had uh, uh, his guy that sold him his clothes come in and look at the clothes and say, yeah, that looks like something that I would have sold him. And then the guy that, it, there was a guy that ha was the, uh, in charge of the estate had a trunk full of clothes. And so he, they took the hat out of the trunk and fitted it in, on top of the skull, and it fit perfectly. <laughs> so that's how they decided it was Humphrey. And then, um, and then after the, they decided this, then the whole thing came out that, it, well, it turns out that Lolo had been married to another guy, her cousin, and it was a bigamist, and the cousin showed up demanding all of the possessions, and the newspaper stories uh, go on and on. So. It, Someday I hope it would be really fun to actually find these bodies in that cemetery. Anyway, all right, so that's my talk. Uh, I'll, if you have questions, I'm glad to answer them. All righty. We actually didn't plan this talk for October, but I'm certainly in the mood for Halloween now. Okay, our first question. 
by Homer. Just it looks like on the map it's 17th and Meyer or Convent. Where is that? It, it, it's uh, 17th and South 9th Avenue is the location of the Native American Cemetery. It's under the street, the adjacent sidewalks, extends into the yards there, but we just don't know how large it is. And I should point out, if you're shy about asking a question, um, you feel free, there's pads of paper and pens on all the tables, write down your question, and I'll pick up the, pick up the question as I come by and read it a little Then I have later. a question right here. Okay. Um, is there any reason that I couldn't bury some family member in the backyard? Is there any re reason that you just couldn't do family burials on the, you know, in your own property? Uh, she asked about family burials. I think you'd have to check with the Office of Vital Statistics up in Phoenix. They're the ones that are in charge of authorizing permits for burials and disinterments. Um, I know that, that it's, it's supposedly illegal to uh, dump cremated remains on like the, up on the National Forests or up on top of Mount Lemmon, but that if you go to certain spots, overlooks, if you look down, you can see fillings and pacemakers and that sort of thing. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Next question's over here. Uh, you mentioned that uh, some of the uh, Native Americans in the 1700s had arthritis and dental uh, wear. What kinds of uh, uh, health indications did you find at later times? Um, when they excavated the remains from the Alameda Stone Cemetery, they had osteologists examine every, uh, every single one of the remains. Uh, they find that typical things, you know, dental problems, broken bones. They found, I think, 16 individuals that had evidence for being uh, killed through gunshots or stab wounds. Um, and those are the ones that they could tell. I mean, there's probably more that where the bullet went right through the body and didn't stay in the body. Um, they had evidence for arthritis, infections, tuberculosis. Um, some of the things that kill people kill you so fast it leaves no evidence on the bones, like smallpox. Um, and again, and, and if you're interested in this, uh, uh, the reports from that Joint Courts Project are online on the Pima County's website. If you type in Pima County Archaeology, Look for the Joint Courts Project. There are three volumes. One is a sort of a uh, put together volume of all the most interesting things. There's one very scientific volume on the human burials, and then one on the historic archaeology of the people that lived there after the cemetery was uh, done being used. All right. And, uh, uh, you mentioned the Workers of the World uh, section in this one cemetery. Yes. Is that the Industrial Workers of the World? The it Wobblies? was the uh, early uh, union. I, I, it's well, they're very left wing. Why would they have their own oh, plot? Th there was a lot of that stuff going on here in Tucson at the time. There was? Yeah. Look, Tucson was I mean, very socialist and left wing revolutionary? Sure. Oh. <laughs> I mean, they were be the, the reason they had these groups was there were a lot of single men in Tucson and with no family members. And so if you had these fraternal groups, you would pay a dollar a month, and if you died unexpectedly, two things happened. They would, be a, they would provide the funeral and have people to actually show up at your funeral. And, if, and in some cases, they had insurance, so you would have some insurance. All right, I have another question here. Oh, I was gonna ask, in the beginning of your presentation, you talked about bones that looked like they could have, these people could have been buried yesterday. Yeah. I didn't understand that. What causes, what changes the bone? Um, she asked about uh, bone preservation. Now, um, the, the caliche in the ground here in many areas uh, uh, is a slightly acidic, and so the bones can uh, be damaged by that. Also, if the person is buried in a coffin, the acids from the woods come out and eat away at the bones. Then you have things like rodents burrowing through or ground pressure or a sewer line being dug right through the middle of the person. Um, so there's a lot of reasons why you, you, most of the historic burials that I've worked on have been damaged to some extent. Th those particular burials at the, in the, I don't know why, they, they were the best preserved I've ever seen. I mean, the bones were absolutely perfect condition, which is great because you can tell a lot more from better preserved skeletons than from damaged ones. Question back here. Hi, Homer. I was just wondering, has anyone done any experimentation in, in the Tucson area with some of these abandoned cemeteries with um, remote sensing techniques like ground penetrating radar or anything like that? Uh, yes. Uh, a guy named Larry Conyers from the University of Denver uh, ran his ground penetrating radar over uh, portions of the 
cemetery, and especially in the area where the uh, Redmond Cemetery was. But he did it after we'd already um, found them, and then we put plastic down and backfilled. And as a result, uh, his signals didn't work out right because of what we had done. So eventually, we'd like to have him go into people's backyards that are, have wider areas. There's a few of those in that cemetery, and look and see if he can find anybody. But it, you know, it's it's the cliche in the ground here makes that uh, uh, doesn't make it work very well compared to other places. Back in the early '80s, as a young professional, I helped take a body out with Walt Berkby and mm -hmm. his grad student down in what I assume is your cemetery number one. Um, Walt was telling all the locals that that area had been cleaned out of the primary number of bodies back right at the turn of the century, and that's when they moved it down to, um, what is it, the, the big cemetery, Green Lawn at, at um, yes. Oracle. And we found at the same time the same thing you guys did of um, multiple levels, because that they, they figured out what Walt, or at least what Walt was telling everybody was that we found out that there were multiple layers, and what we would removed was a poor lady from the second layer, yeah. and of course the next day, not knowing what was going on, the poor backhoe operator came down and hit a third. Oh. Um, is, so my question really is, is, is that the area that, that became later, you know, those bodies were moved out to, yes. to Oracle? Okay. Um, there were advertisements in the newspaper in 1915 asking people to come and excavate their burials of relatives and friends. The funeral homes advertised that they would do it for you. There are descriptions in the newspaper of big holes in the ground that people were falling into. Um, and uh, my guess is that fewer than half of the bodies, um, probably only 20% were actually moved. And you go out to Holy Hope and Evergreen Cemeteries, you can find tombstones from the, the cemetery that were moved out there. But you, for one thing, you don't know for certain whether the people actually were moved with them. And if the person was buried in that cemetery and didn't have a tombstone after 20 or 30 years, there's not gonna be much evidence on the ground surface for them. So um, I'm guessing that they're, each, each residential lot in that neighborhood probably has between 100 and 150 bodies still there. And you talk to the people in the neighborhood and they say like, oh yeah, I was planting a tree in the backyard and I hit somebody, so I stopped. You know. Is there any more questions? Question in the back? One this way, okay. Um, prob probably one of the most famous murders in Tucson was Frank Stillwell by Wyatt mm -hmm. Earp and Doc Holliday. Have they ever found the remains of this guy or? Um, I think Frank Stillwell was buried in the Court Street Cemetery, but I'm not sure if he was one of the ones that was exhumed or moved. I'd have to look and see. He's, I know he's in my database as someone who died in Tucson at that time, but, I, at, but by the time the railroad got here, they could ship bodies out. So there were a lot of people that came here that from, with tuberculosis and promptly died because you know, it was a fatal disease back then. They would package them up. The undertaker would embalm them and put them in an airtight casket and they'd ship them out all over the country. So I don't know if Mr. Stillwell was one of the ones that got sent away. If you don't mind, I always thought the cemetery was the other side of stone and so it's very enlightening to see that it was actually west of stone mm -hmm. where those houses are. There's a vacant lot north of the Salvation Army. Yes. It recently has a fence around it and I'm just curious if you know. Is that was the Redmond area. All right. Yes. And is that is that able to be developed as is? Well, um, because there, it's known, uh, there are two areas of burials on that Salvation Army property, they cannot build over it because they know that there are remains there. So they have two options. One is to exhume the bodies and have them moved to Evergreen Cemetery, or two, they could, on their project they're planning, they're planning to, to, to build another homeless shelter in that area, would be to have that as a lawn area and basically leave it as open space, undeveloped. All right. Well, I thank everybody for coming tonight. It's been fun talking to you. Oh, I got one. Yeah, one last question. One last question. When bodies are exhumed, what actually is moved? We, uh, we excavate them, all the human remains, the associated uh, artifacts, the clothing remains, the coffin remains. 
We screen the dirt through window mesh, and any dirt that has bone fragments gets packaged up, and all that is taken and uh, first to the university, and then it goes out to either Evergreen or Holy Hope or All Faiths, and they rebury those remains all together. Everything gets reburied. Um, at, when they reburied the uh, Alameda Stone Cemetery, they had a big plot at all face, and they laid the burials out in boxes in the same order as they were in the ground, so the same relationship, so that if someone was buried next to somebody else, that's the way it is now. If we're, for these isolated burials that are found, uh, Evergreen and Holy Hope both have uh, vaults where they put them. All right. Thank you. Okay. A couple of housekeeping things. Um, we will not be having a cafe on the first Tuesday of next month because the first Tuesday of next month is election night. I'm going to be far too nervous to, uh, to be, be hosting. Um, please vote early and vote effectively. Um, and I really would like to thank the, the staff of uh, Casa Vicente tonight. They really bent over backwards to accommodate a, a larger crowd than anybody was expecting. Thank you, thank you, thank you.